Good evening to everyone and thank you so much for joining us again today on our SK Dharmalingam lecture series. I am Dr. Tasha from the National Cancer Society of Malaysia. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Ahmad Sufyan Nabarahman. He's a consultant medical oncologist who works at the Columbia Asia Hospital at Bukit Rimau. And he's also the director at Cancer CRI Center. So uh, in a bit, Dr. Sufyan will be giving us a talk on precision oncology in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer. Okay, uh, to you then, Dr. Sufyan. Thank you so much, Dr. Tasha and the National Cancer Society of Malaysia for this opportunity to present in this lecture series, focusing on the molecular profiling and precision oncology. And as uh, promised uh, previously, we will be handling about six uh, talks in this uh, lecture series. And this is actually the second talk. The first talk was held in September this year. So what I will be doing is I'll share my screen now. So our topic today will be on the precision oncology in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer. I have to make a disclaimer first. Uh, first of all, this um, talk will be quite complex as it is actually a complex topic. But the challenge for me and for you guys is to make it as, as simple as possible. We hope that the health professionals, be it from the general practitioners right uh, to the uh, level of specialist uh, oncologists, would be able to uh, enjoy and follow the lecture. So next slide. Okay. So just before, before we move on, just to um, remind everyone that uh, November is the Lung Cancer Awareness Month. So we at Cancer CRI Center, we are trying to raise the awareness through the social media channels uh, to inform people about what, what could be some of the risk factors associated with lung cancer, what could be some of the symptoms associated with lung cancer, when do you need to consult your medical practitioners in order to get advice with regards to lung cancer, and so on and so forth. Now, the agenda for today, we will be talking about various aspects of this topic on advanced non-small cell lung cancer. So I will start by presenting a couple of cases, uh, followed by talking about the epidemiology and the reality of lung cancer. We will then look into the classification of non-small cell lung cancer, and we will move towards the actionable mutations in non-small cell lung cancer. The talk will then continue to look at the resistance development, companion diagnostic, next generation sequencing and liquid biopsy, the challenges and opportunity in Malaysia, and of course, at the end, it will be the take home messages. But in fact, I will put the take home messages up front, given that the topic is quite complex. Essentially, what we want you to be taking home from this talk today, the first one would be on there are various targeted therapy that can be used in the context of non-small cell lung cancer. So that's the first thing to establish. And we also know that precision oncology, meaning testing for the genes that we can target in lung cancer, can first better survival benefits and quality of life for patients with non-small cell lung cancer harboring oncogene addicted mutations. The third one, Upfront next generation sequencing and subsequent genetic testing upon development of resistance are important to help with planning of therapy. The fourth point, clinical trials are an important aspect in the treatment of lung cancer and molecular profiling could help link patients to potentially available clinical trials. Last but not least, discussion with your treating oncologist and seeking opinions from reliable health professionals would be paramount to avoid financial toxicity as we use the targeted therapy in the context of lung cancer. Now, so the, the first case that I want to present is a case on a what we call as bronchogenic carcinoma uh, with a histology of squamous cell carcinoma. So this is a 65-year-old man, a heavy smoker, 
with a previous history of metachronous cancer. So you can see that from 2013 to, 2000, to 2017, he was actually diagnosed with a stage three rectal cancer. And for that, he received the new adjuvant long course chemo radiation therapy before he proceeded with the abdominal perineal resection and then an adjuvant K-POX chemotherapy for a period of three months. In 2017, he was diagnosed with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. For this, he received the uh, dissection right down to the cervical area in the neck, and then uh, the adjuvant radiation treatment was provided. Uh, he has been on remission since 2018. About the same time, he actually received the CT scan of the chest as part of the staging. And during that time, he was found to have a speculated lesion in the right side of the lung. Having had a couple of cancers in the past and not wanting to do anything aggressive, he thought that he would want to leave that uh, speculated, speculated lesion for quite a bit. Uh, he declined the surgical resection of the speculated lesion or the stereotactic radiation therapy. Unfortunately, over time, the uh, cancer continued to progress. So he developed shortness of breath on exertion and right chest wall pain in March 2022. The restaging CT scan was performed and he was found to have right hilar mass, increasing in size, impinging against the pulmonary artery and the invasion of the atrial myocardium. He was seen by the radiation oncologist who provided the palliative radiation treatment to the lesion with a 20 gray in five fraction. He was reviewed in August 2022 with a restaging CT scan, which further showed the disease progression uh, and the extension into the interventricular junction of the heart. When I saw him in the clinic, he has an ECOG performance status of three with an exercise tolerance of 50 to 100 meter only. The caveat in, the, in this case, though, is that the ECOG performance status for him uh, was not associated with the uh, extent of the tumor burden. Rather, it is because of the proximity of the right uh, lung mass to the heart with the invasion of the right atrium and the interventricular junction that confers the shortness of breath on exertion. The chemotherapy was declined by the medical oncologist given the chemotherapy associated risk plus his ECOG performance status. And this is where I want to make a point. If you look at November 2021, so the CT scans on the left side, you can see the images that show the bronchogenic carcinoma originated from the bronchus uh, with proximity to the right side of the heart. And the images on the right uh, the CT scan performed in August 2022, which showed continued disease progression at which, at which state his ECOG performance status um, was 3. So this is the, the kind of cancer you see in a heavy smoker. Squamous cell carcinoma tends to be more uh, proximal, um, uh, and that's the kind of pattern you're seeing. Now, the second type of lung cancer uh, is this case, uh, the case two, the lung adenocarcinoma with EGFR mutation. Now, this is a patient that I saw a few years ago. In fact, it was in New Zealand, but it is actually a, a Chinese lady from Malaysia. So she's a 30 year old Chinese lady who has never been a smoker. So that's an important point to make. Uh, she presented with a month history of shortness of breath on exertion. Uh, it wasn't actually realized by her, except for when she actually started to train before uh, for her plan to go for skydiving. So that was the time where she realized that she started to have breathlessness on exertion. Some other associated symptoms include the dry cough and right upper quadrant pain. Initially, like everyone else, when you've got this at such a young age, you thought that, you know, maybe you've got a chest infection. Uh, so when you went, uh, when she went to see her GP that time, her GP started her on antibiotics. Unfortunately, after about a month period, things have not settled, for which reason further investigations were done. The chest x-ray showed that she's got multiple lung lesions in both lungs, and the CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis showed that she's got bilateral lung metastasis, ground glass changes, and numerous liver metastasis.
she had the liver biopsy performed, which showed that she's got EGFR mutation, EGFR L858R mutation. So this is the second type of lung cancer. So the CT scan images here, this is not actually hers, but uh, the uh, images depicted the similar uh, distribution of cancer as what uh, she had. So on the left side, you can see numerous liver metastases. And on the right side, you can see miliary pattern of um, uh, disease in her lungs. Now, unfortunately, she could not afford the uh, third generation uh, uh, EGFR inhibitor or at that time, and it was not funded as well. So she was started on the first generation called Kifitinib, and she was actually showing a good partial response in the liver and the lungs. Um, the only thing is that with gefitinib, as we know that in some people, it could cause um, acute transaminitis, and that's exactly what she uh, experienced, for which reason we actually ceased the therapy, waited for the liver function to recover, and we started her at a lower dose. Now, I want to move now, remembering these two uh, uh, paradigms or two cases, we're going to go down uh, and look at the epidemiology of non-small cell lung cancer. A first point to make, this is the data from the Global Can 2020, so the data from the World Health Organization. Uh, it shows us that lung cancer uh, is the cancer with the highest mortality rate. Although it is the third most common cancer worldwide, it is actually the highest in terms of the mortality. So if you calculate that incidence to mortality ratio, then you would realize that the um, incidence to mortality ratio for lung cancer is the highest. Now, if we actually drill and zoom into our own country, Malaysia, the situation is not much different. So on the left, on the top left there, you can see that lung cancer is the third most common cancer in our country with the incidence of 9.8 uh, per 100,000 population uh, age standardized. Uh, at the bottom left, you can see the data that shows that uh, most of the lung cancer in our country um, are diagnosed uh, at stage three and four. So uh, as high as 89% uh, uh, of the lung cancer in the country were diagnosed in stage three and four. And if you look at the National Cancer Registry report of our country for a period between 2012 and 2016, you can see the bar graph uh, on the right side there actually shows the survival rate for different types of cancer. So the pink one would indicate the survival rate at one year, and the, the, the purple one uh, shows you the survival rate at five years. If you look at the bottom of that diagram, you would see lung cancer there with one year survival, survival rate of only 35.5% and the five year survival rate of only 11%. Again, that suggests that uh, the mortality from lung cancer and the prognosis from lung cancer is not great. Now, let's move on to uh, think a bit more about the classification. Again, this is where the, the two cases outlined earlier would become very important. Classically, we know um, during and after World War I, where the uh, cigarette smoking was actually introduced, uh, we saw the increase in the incidence of this new entity called lung cancer uh, in the Western population. The typical type of lung cancer during that time uh, was squamous cell lung cancer, and the other one was a small cell lung cancer. Uh, what happened then, uh, it's not until uh, after World War II where scientists start, uh, started to publish some of the studies indicating association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Uh, since then, then the big drive for the smoking cessation program uh, was launched in the Western countries and uh, over decades, then we started to see the decline in the incidence of these types of um, lung cancer. Uh, 
Well, that's the case, the migration of these uh, smoking lifestyle pattern to the Asian population uh, has shown us where the incidence of lung cancer in the Asian population uh, continues to go up while the incidence in the Western population uh, continues to go down. Some refinement occurs in the uh, occurred in the um, uh, smoking industry or in the cigarette smoking industry where uh, the introduction of filters, the decrease in the tar, uh, to, uh, tar percentage in the um, cigarette, um, uh, in some ways have actually shown how the transition occurs in the histological subtype of lung cancer. So more and more we are seeing people presented with another histological type called adenocarcinoma, um, and a decrease in the percentage of diagnosis of squamous cell lung cancer. In essence, uh, the classification for lung cancer can be divided into small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. Under non-small cell lung cancer, uh, it is further subdivided into adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. Now, that's not the whole story. What we realize in our Asian population, in the Asian region, is this phenomenon of lung cancer in young female Asian who are never smokers. This is actually quite uh, striking and quite um, intriguing given um, no risk factors in this population uh, were known at that time. Of course, there have been a few other risk factors associated with lung cancer, including secondhand smokers, air pollution, the radon gas. This is particularly in the population that work in the mining areas, uh, cooking fumes, and of course, um, for some people with susceptible genes. And we will talk a bit more and relate these susceptible genes to this young female Asian and never smokers population because uh, this makes up an important group uh, in the adenocarcinoma, uh, which actually leads to the um, development uh, of the molecular profiling and targeted therapy in the space of lung cancer. Now, what's interesting, we were talking about young Asian never smokers. We were talking about susceptible genes and we were saying that, look, you know, what causes lung cancer in these uh, young Asian population? So a recent um, study by the Francis Crick Institute and the University College London, uh, the group actually presented their uh, work uh, during the recent ASMO uh, Congress in 2022. Uh, they presented the mechanistic explanation, the linkage between the uh, air pollution with the particulate matters of 2.5 micrometers and the development of lung cancer in never smokers, in people who are known to harbor EGFR and KRAS gene mutations. So the, the thinking is that people who've got, or who, who have got these mutations in the normal lung tissues, when they are exposed to these uh, particulate matters, the lung tissues over time release um, a, a chemical, uh, what's called as interleukin uh, one beta. And this interleukin is what uh, eventually uh, leads to the expansion uh, of the uh, cells and the development of uh, lung cancer in, in this population. Of course, a lot of things need to be thought further in terms of could this be, be used to start to design the preventive therapy uh, in this group of population and so on and so forth. Now, another part when we talk about the susceptibility genes just now is thinking about the lung cancer as caused by the hereditary genes. So this is one of the three concepts depicted here in the, in the diagram here. So on the left, uh, there are certain uh, cancer uh, predisposition syndromes. So for instance, people with um, Lee-Fromini syndrome, so when they, where they have the TP53 mutation. They can develop uh, various types of cancer, including breast cancer and also lung cancer. So this is, um, again, one way where lung cancer develop, can develop. 
and people in people who harbor this hereditary hereditary uh, genetic mutation. The other way is, of course, with the mutation uh, in the EGFR. And the third one is in the mutation of certain genes that can lead to the development of lung disease. So for instance, uh, bronchiectasis or chronic airway disease or emphysema, which will over time, um, because of the inflammation that leads to the development of lung cancer. So the data from uh, the U.S. suggested that it can be as high as to, what, 10 to 20 percent of patients uh, with lung cancer that could harbor these hereditary, hereditary oncogenes. Now, so we've now put the classification. So we were talking about um, the histological classification just now. We were talking about potential risk factors, but all those things initially don't matter so much because regardless of the histological subtypes, the treatment in the advanced non-small cell lung cancer setting would be with the use of chemotherapy. So you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves, all the three curves there. So that's the publication uh, in 2011, where they look at the use of a platinum agent in combination with pemetrexid versus platinum agent carboplatin in combination with doxytaxel, whether the platinum plus uh, permetraxate would confer better overall survival in adenocarcinoma. Now, if you look at the top one, the survival without toxicity, the median survival difference was actually uh, 3.7 months versus 0.7 months, which suggests that carboplatin plus permetraxate is superior than carboplatin plus doxytaxel in adenocarcinoma. But if we look actually uh, at both of the curves and we look at you know uh, 36 months or 33 months, the survival or the overall survival around that time was only 10 to 15%. We can extend this. Some other data suggests the five-year survival uh, for lung cancer would be between, you know, a five to 10%. So while we are saying that, um, again, with the use of the systemic chemotherapy, we have not yet achieved a longer survival uh, or much longer survival that we want. And if we apply this to the younger population that we mentioned, the young Asian never smokers who are diagnosed perhaps in their 20s or 30s, certainly um, such prognosis is really terrible. Now, this is where um, the work to look into um, the use of uh, targetable oncogene driver mutations uh, come into picture. Now, the landmark paper, the first one, uh, is the study called IPAST study. Initially, we know that for many cancers, uh, if you remember from my talk previously, the Cancer Genome Atlas work that was done, uh, they figured that for different types of cancer, there can be uh, several canonical pathways involved where the uh, oncogene driver mutations that occur in various types of these cancers um, could be targeted with targeted therapy. And it is the nature of uh, some of the cancer cells that they are dependent upon these oncogene, oncogene driver mutations in order to uh, grow and to, to proliferate. Now, because of that, some of the EGFR inhibitors like cetuximab, gefitinib, and erlotinib were initially used for various types of cancers. But unfortunately, the response rate uh, 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 has not been great. So we were talking about a single digit response rate, and even with gefitinib, uh, the response rate was less than 10%. Now, this IPAS study initially looked at uh, the use of gefitinib in this uh, East Asian population. And uh, strikingly, they figured that uh, in the East Asian population, the response rate and the progression-free survival uh, were much better uh, than uh, uh, when you compare the use in the, um, uh, the whole lung cancer uh, population, not separated by uh, this um, uh, East Asian population. 
uh, that leads to the further work in the field of this EGF, EGF mutation. And what's so striking about it is they found that the EGF mutation is present in the East Asian population and is a very strong predictor, a biomarker predictor for response to this targeted therapy using the gefitinib. And so if you can see the um, that in the diagram, uh, the B diagram showed to us that the progression survival, free survival with the use of gefitinib is superior to the chemotherapy with the use of carboplatin plus paclitaxel. Uh, similarly, if you look at the um, um, EGFR mutation negative, when uh, there's no mutation, the gefitinib group did worse than the chemotherapy group. So that's the first landmark paper. And the second one that I want to show you is in the use of the ALK inhibitor, ALK inhibitor. As we know, ALK um, uh, rearrangement or alterations were initially found in B cell lymphoma and several other cancers. The further work realized that some, you know, as high as 5% of the population in lung cancer could harbor, this, harbor these alterations. And there can be about 14 alterations found, and the famous or the common one known is the ALK EML4 mutation. Uh, the work in this field, uh, the development of the drug called Prezatinib uh, in this clinical trial called Profile 1014, um, showed us that the use of Prezatinib in the alt positive patients lead to the better or superior progression-free survival when compared to chemotherapy. You might ask, as is the case in the EGFR mutation or ALK mutation, Doctor, you mentioned about progression-free survival is better, but it seems that the overall survival is much the same when you compare it with chemotherapy. Uh, but uh, there have been debates about this and further discussion within the scientific com community. And notably, uh, the trial design for both of these trials uh, are such that the crossover uh, were allowed um, between the chemotherapy arm to the chrysotinib arm. So what has uh, most likely occurred is the dilution of the overall survival benefit seen in the chrysotinib because the population with chemotherapy or with the use of the chemotherapy crossed over to the, with, uh, to the use of the chrysotinib or before the um, osimatinib uh, upon disease progression. Now, this is where we come back to our first lecture, where we were talking about the canonical pathways. Just to remind everyone, we mentioned that, you know, in normal cells, we have got a lot of pathways, intracellular pathways, and also pathways of interaction between different cells and the environment. Uh, all these pathways are important to ensure continued growth and proliferation of normal cells. Unfortunately, in cancer cells, some of the pathways become uh, magnified and dependent upon by these cancer cells to continue to survive. And the thinking is that some of these pathways, they exist in different types of cancer, and for that reason, they can be targeted. And the initial work with um, EGFR inhibitor and uh, uh, ALK inhibitor uh, had led to the expansion in uh, lung cancer field and lung cancer classification. In fact, among the tumor streams, lung cancer is the pioneer and the leading cancer that pave and craft the molecular and precision oncology uh, treatments for cancer. So if you look at the top left diagram there, you would realize that initially we've got non-small cell lung cancer and we've got the histological subtyping into adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and others. Uh, and the proportion of adenocarcinoma has continued to increase with the changing and the pattern and behavior with regards to smoking. So 55% of the composition of non-small cell lung cancer uh, is, is the adenocarcinoma. 
Um, then we realize within that um, adenocarcinoma, we can have different mutations or different mutational classification. Uh, so you can have KRAS up to 25%, EGFR mutation 10%. Again, we have to remember that uh, it depends a little bit upon the population that you perform this testing. So for instance, uh, in the Asian population, you can see EGFR mutation up to 40%. So much different to what we're showing you here. But this is just to give you an example of how different mutations exist in adenocarcinoma. We mentioned last time as well that hmm, it's probably in the adenocarcinoma, not so much squamous cell carcinoma, but if you look at the mutations when they perform the genetic testing, some of these mutations are also prior in squamous cell carcinoma. We realized that um, as the two cases I've shown you, you know, the smoking and non-smoking lung, can lung cancer population, and we said that perhaps for the non-smokers, we can see these genetic signatures, uh, but not so, so much in smokers. But the study on the right side actually proves us wrong because even in the former or current smokers with adenocarcinoma, you would be able to see some of these mutations. Right, so we've got now the from um, histological classification into genomic or genetic classification and the introduction uh, of the use of targeted therapy with the use of EGFR inhibitor and ALK inhibitor. Now, over the years, um, if you remember from 2009 with that iPass study, we figured out at least nine actionable mutations in lung cancer. So uh, if you look, um, the KRAS G12C mutation uh, on the left, right down to the N-track fusion. So this diagram, how you read it, the bigger the circle, the bigger is the percentage of mutation uh, that you will find in lung cancer. So for instance, KRAS G12C, you would find that in 10 to 15% uh, of people with lung cancer. EGFR, again, similar 10 to 15%, and NTRAC would be most likely less than 1%. And at the top and the bottom of that circles, you would see different uh, drugs that have been developed and approved, either conditional or accelerated approval by FDA. For instance, the Keras G12C, the use of Soterosib, EGFR mutation, the use of the Gefitinib, right down to Ozimatinib, the ALK, use of crezatinib right down to lolatinib, and so on and so forth. On the left side, I mentioned that immune and cell-based therapy. This is because in the uh, landscape of advanced non-small cell lung cancer, in people who do not harbor these mutations mentioned, uh, this is where the immune therapy and cell-based therapy become important, uh, but it won't be discussed in this presentation as our focus for today is on um, precision oncology and non-small cell lung cancer. Now, so what I've done here is I've created this table and uh, what I've done is I've populated the figures uh, of efficacy endpoints uh, based on different types of mutations that you can see in lung cancer. As a caveat to this, uh, for the experts and people who are in the um, research field, you would say that there are a lot of things that are wrong with this table. The reason for that is number one, you never do the um, uh, endpoints comparison between two different trials when the two drugs are not hit to hit. And the second thing is when you compare it this way, you know, you are comparing a different trial population, a different way of uh, uh, statistical design, trial design, sample size, and so on and so forth. So the only intent of this table is really to give us a big picture of whether some of these drugs really work in lung cancer. So what we call as efficacy, rather than looking at the uh, population effectiveness. So if you look down the column, the different mutation, you can see for different types of actionable mutations, 
the objective tumor response rate, which is uh, consists of a combination of partial response and complete response percentage, um, they are actually quite high, suggesting that these drugs have the capacity to shrink down the tumor um, by 30% or more. Similarly, the ability to control the tumor before progression uh, is also seen uh, across different types of uh, these mutations. Now, the caveat and the difficulty, I suppose, is in um, uh, uh, demonstrating the overall survival for some of the mutations. Uh, the reasons could be multifactorial. Number one, the crossover design allowed. Number two, the sample size of the studies, if you remember, because the percentage of each mutation uh, could be very small, and the small sample size that we we're having, then the use of the overall survival endpoint, for instance, might not be um, as easy or as accurate, would have a statistical enough power to, um, to really prove it. Uh, and that's perhaps uh, the reason uh, why, you know, we, we are having this uh, mixed uh, pattern in the overall survival um, uh, um, uh, figures. So the thing I want to highlight, though, uh, are a few. So num number one, we're seeing here the activity of TKIs against these mutations. Uh, the second one is um, we are seeing here the efficacy at the clinical trials level. Um, and the majority of effects we're seeing are in the objective theme response to depression free survival. We mentioned about the issues with regards to the overall survival. And um, what's important is um, as far as, as much as we are seeing the response, uh, the side effect profile uh, is different from chemotherapy. And for some of these trials, uh, they showed that the quality of life of patients uh, were better. Uh, and of course, the reduction of the risk of CNS metastasis or the reduction uh, of the risk of progression of CNS metastasis, and of course, the overall survival for some of these trials. Now, this is where then we come from the clinical trials uh, efficacy results into the guideline. So ASMO, the European Society Medical Onco of Medical Oncologists, uh, had developed the Pan-Asian Guideline for the treatment of advanced non-small cell lung cancer. So essentially on the left side, you're with EGFR activating mutation, and on the right side, you're seeing people with ELK, BRAF, and ROS1 mutations, or, or ROS1 mutation. Essentially, the division... Uh, is due to uh, the thinking that uh, um, these mutations tend to uh, exist uh, in the mutually exclusive manner. So for the left side, or on the left side, you can see people who've got this EGF or activating mutation, uh, they can be offered one of the uh, TKIs there, either gefitinib, erlotinib, uh, decamitinib, ozimatinib. And if they progress, if they've got what's called as oligoprogression, so maybe they've got only a few number of uh, uh, tumors in different cells of the body that uh, had progressed, then what can be done is the radiation therapy can be um, delivered to those areas and the treatment with the uh, TKI uh, can be continued. Uh, or if there is a, a, an evidence of systemic progression, then de it depends a little bit on the TKI that uh, was used previously. Uh, it if it was a gefitinib or a lotinib, then the uh, resistant mutation can be checked. So a mutation called T790 mutation. Uh, and if that mutation uh, is present, then patient can be put on the next uh, TKI called ozimatinib uh, and continue until continue until progression. Um, on the right side, uh, it is a similar story. So if you've got the out translocation, a patient can be started uh, with a crisotinib uh, or alactinib or seritinib or brigatinib or another new agent called lolatinib. Uh, if patient was on crisotinib or alactinib before and they progressed, they can be started on brigatinib or lolatinib. Okay, so this is just to give the example or the idea of how the therapy is used in the landscape of lung cancer. 
Now, this is where we actually dwell into some of the data that we mentioned. So first of all, this is the data from Flora, which is the phase three uh, clinical trial looking at the use of osimatinib, uh, which is a third generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor against the EGFR mutation. And comparing that with the previous generation TKI, TKI called gefitinib or erlotinib. So on the left side there, you can see the uh, uh, better or the superior overall survival with the median overall survival at 38.6 months versus 31.8 months with uh, gefitinib or erlotinib. On the right side, what you're seeing there is the progression-free survival uh, in patients with metastasis or uh, overall uh, or um, uh, uh, and, and the median overall survival as well. So important point to make is that with ozematinib, you can see that the progression-free survival in patients with CNS metastasis is also superior than uh, the standard EGFR TKI. Of course, we can debate a bit about the what's the primary endpoint of the study, but the overall trend here suggests that ozematinib is active in actually controlling the CNS metastasis. Uh, similarly, in the uh, alt translocation field, we can see the use of the newer generation of, uh, of um, TKI called brigatinib. Uh, the study ALTA uh, 1L suggested here that the progression free survival uh, is superior when compared with a crizotinib. You can see the um, uh, best change from baseline in target lesions. The figure C over there, you can see mark uh, what we call as the objective tumor response rate and also the deep, uh, the depth of response to the treatment. Um, and then you can see the um, figure D, uh, survival without intracranial disease, uh, progression among patients with brain metastasis at baseline, again, brigatinib uh, was shown to have superiority over presartinib in controlling CNS metastasis. Um, this is, uh, again, similar with the newer generation of ALK inhibitor called lolatinib. Uh, the pattern we are seeing uh, is similar and it is much more active than presartinib. So we've been talking about targeted therapy, targeting the uh, um, res, uh, targeting the um, actionable mutations in lung cancer. But one big problem in the use of targeted therapy is uh, the development of resistance. Uh, as we've mentioned in our first lecture, cancer is a very clever disease. The cancer cells are very dynamic and you've got what's called as cancer stem cells. They've got the capacity to, um, uh, to avoid uh, the um, treatments or the drugs. They have the capacity to develop the resistance and confer the drugs that we are giving to be uh, uh, non-beneficial over a long period of time, after a long period of time. So what do we do when uh, patients develop resistance de uh, resist resistance to the initial targeted therapy that we've given? Uh, first thing to note is there are a couple of domains where the cancer cells can develop uh, resistance. Uh, the first one would be the on-target resistance. And the second one would be off-target resistance mechanism development. So for instance, in the context of each GFR XO19 mutation, uh, when you give uh, any patient with gefitinib, over time, um, patient can develop T790 mutation, which is what we call as a gatekeeper mutation in exon 20. Uh, when this happens, then the drug is no longer uh, active or no longer um, efficacious when compared to before. Similarly, when we give ozimatinib in EGFR mutant lung cancer up front, over time, patient can develop other mutations like C797S or metaxon fully skipping mutation, which then reduce the efficacy of ozimatinib. So how do we deal with that? So there are a few ways we can um, uh, approach this. The first one is to um, test for the resistant mutation. This is where uh, the use of the uh, next generation sequencing or PCR 
uh, and other methods of testing the genetic mutation becomes important. Or with the similar methods I mentioned just now, we can test for the co-mutations. So for instance, people with EGFR mutation could also have another mutation called MET amplification. Or we can use now uh, move to chemotherapy plus minus the use of immunotherapy plus minus anti-angiogenic medication. Uh, as I've shown you in the ASMO guideline just now, uh, if what's shown from the CT scan is oligoprogression, then use of RT radiation treatment or other local approach uh, like surgery can be on top of uh, proceeding and continuing with the existing targeted therapy. Last but not least is, of course, uh, with um, the exploration of clinical trials and engaging patients into um, uh, pragmatic and available uh, and relevant clinical trials, depending on the patient's context. Now, this is where we actually go a little bit and think uh, about um, uh, testing for the genetic mutation in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, the reason for this is that um, to use the targeted therapy, we need to know the genetic mutations, the oncogene driver mutations. But to know these genetic mutations, uh, of course, we need to do the testing. So traditionally, you can see on the left side there, the way um, the drugs have been developed uh, is with the use of this companion diagnostic. Uh, so what it means is that, for instance, uh, the EGFR mutation, so you do the EGFR PCR, and then we found the EGFR PCR, we use that as a predictive biomarker and we test it against the drug in GFR inhibitor. And what has happened is uh, the same approach has been used to develop several other targeted therapy, as we've mentioned, our inhibitor and track fusion uh, inhibitor, uh, ROS1 inhibitor, and so on and so forth. Now with that, there are several advantages. Uh, for instance, the, it requires a small amount of tissues. Uh, but what comes as a problem is that um, uh, with PCR or FISH or IHC, we can only uh, test for a single gene or a small number of genes. Now, over time, what has developed as well is this technology we call next generation sequencing. And the advantages of that is that we can uh, test for several number of genes uh, to a few hundred of genes, or even in fact to whole exome sequencing or to whole genome sequencing. So testing the number of genes become no issues. Uh, we can detect co-mutations. There will be a higher pickup rate for these mutations. But the problem uh, using this technique is you need the uh, good amount of tissues. So this is where the role of uh, pathologists become, uh, becomes really important uh, to ensure that we are taking enough number of tissues when the biopsy is performed. So this is where we come to the center, that tissue, tissue is what's needed for either PCR or next generation sequencing. The, the, but the problem with non-small cell lung cancer is a tissue biopsy is not necessarily easy to do. A lot of uh, patients with lung cancer, they are quite crooked. They might have COPD. They haven't got uh, good lungs. And the procedure either with the use of the EBAS or a percutaneous biopsy or crooked biopsy might not be necessarily something easy uh, to do. Uh, um, or uh, patients might decline uh, for those kind of procedures to be done. So to overcome these, uh, these challenges mentioned, um, the liquid biopsy has also come into uh, the field. Uh, with liquid biopsy, you can either do the PCR on the left side, and now more and more people are moving towards the use of liquid biopsy for next generation sequencing. And it is important because in uh, EGFR mutation lung cancer, for instance, then you can detect the T790 mutation in uh, the blood. And you don't need to do the tissue biopsy, except what I've mentioned there, the problem is if you've got a false negative result from your blood case, then um, you will need to do the tissue biopsy to confirm. On the right side, 
the use of liquid biopsy in next generation sequencing, the advantages include high concordance between tissue and liquid. So which means that it is a reliable test, even though what you're doing is a blood test rather than the tissue test. It has got a faster turnaround time, but the problem is that we know that uh, the tumor shedding issues, which means that uh, in people with lung cancer, some people might shed more tumors than others, and that could affect the ability to detect uh, the uh, mutations in the blood. And also different providers might have different uh, varied allelic frequency threshold, which means the sensitivity to detect uh, any particular mutations in the blood might be different be uh, uh, between different companies and different panels. So more and more, we are moving now towards a combination of tissue and liquid biopsy. And the advantages are as mentioned at the bottom there. But the problem at this stage is, of course, uh, with regards to the cost. Now, so what are the challenges in Malaysia and opportunities through research and clinical trials as far as precision oncology and in small cell lung cancer is concerned? Number one, the challenge is that the price and accessibility to cancer genomic profiling, so the cancer genomic profiling is still quite expensive in Malaysia. Uh, it's, it is not um, fully covered by the insurance company, and most of the time, patient needs to pay, pay it out of their pocket. The second thing is the molecular tumor board availability to provide patient-centered clinical recommendations. Uh, third one is availability of subsidized cancer-targeted therapy. Uh, most of the cancer-targeted therapy in Malaysia are still unfunded, except for uh, uh, very few. Uh, next, limited lung cancer clinical trials in Malaysia that employ the molecular targets. Most of the cancer clinical trials, um, they, 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 they are in the realm of the immunotherapy. Uh, limited investigative initiated trials that can comp compensate for the um, industry-sponsored trials. And of course, limited real-world effectiveness studies to evaluate lower doses of targeted therapy. This is a, an important avenue because we know that uh, from the pharmacodynamic point of view, the, the targeted therapy with T TKI has got the white therapeutic index, which means that the treatment efficacy uh, uh, could plateau much earlier than the indicated dose uh, that's used commonly in our clinical practice. So if we can actually use the uh, same therapy at uh, much lower doses, we could actually save some costs and make the treatments to be more affordable. So um, uh, in summary, uh, the take home messages for, from the presentation that I've just done just now are a few as to what we've mentioned. First one, targeted therapy can be used in the context of non-small cell lung cancer. It is in fact a standard of care globally. Uh, precision oncology confers better survival benefits, quality of life. It controls the uh, cerebral, cerebral uh, CNS metastases better. Um, the upfront next generation sequencing and subsequent genetic testing upon resistance development are important uh, to help with the planning of therapy. Clinical trials are important as back in the treatment of lung cancer. And the use of molecular profiling could hopefully link some of uh, these population or cohorts with the available clinical trials. And of course, discussion with your treating oncologist and seeking opinions from reliable health professionals would be paramount to avoid financial toxicity. So I would um, end it there and open the session for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sufyan, for taking the time of your busy schedule to give us this talk today. Um, but before we go, um, I've got a few questions for you, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'll start with the first one, yeah. Um, when do you think patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer need to have molecular profiling testing then? Yeah, that's a very good question, um, Dr. Tasha. So essentially, Actually, these days in the context of advanced non-small cell lung cancer, so by that we mean people with stage 4 disease or advanced unresectable non-small cell lung cancer, uh, testing uh, with molecular up, uh, profiling up front would be favorable. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, number one, if you know the uh, uh, oncogene-addicted mutations early on, then you can 
and actually plan and start them on the targeted therapy. And this would give them a better chance of responding to the treatment as well as having better uh, progression-free survival and uh, reducing the risk of the uh, CNS metastases. And as per what cl the clinical trials have shown us, um, these people would have a better quality of life. So if at all possible to do it upfront would be uh, would be uh, what we would recommend. But of course, if there is an issue of getting this uh, upfront, you can start with the chemotherapy or chemotherapy in combination with immunotherapy. And when you've got this available, then you can do uh, the molecular profiling testing. Of course, there have been debates between the scientific uh, within the scientific community. If you don't do it, uh, or you start with the immunotherapy in combination with the chemo, there could be issues when you want to start um, the targeted therapy, especially uh, some of the side effects like interstitial pneumonitis and so on. But of course, you, you could only work uh, with what's available uh, in your locality. Okay. Thank you. Um, another one. Um, what could be the solution to the cost barrier in accessing the targeted therapy in non-small cell lung cancer? Yeah, so um, this is a very interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, cost is a big issue, not only in Malaysia or in low and middle income countries, but even in the high income countries. Um, so just to give you an example, for instance, the uh, targeted therapy like ozumatinib could cost um, uh, right up to about 30,000 ringgit uh, per month. Uh, so for many, uh, this is actually not affordable. Uh, but that's why the molecular profiling program becomes important because when you do genomic profiling and you've got a database of, um, you know, uh, X number of patients with different types of mutations, that could open the door for the development of more uh, cancer clinical trials based on the um, actionable mutations mentioned. Uh, so that means that if there are more uh, clinical trials available, these patients can be linked up to these clinical trials and they can access the drugs without having to pay. So that's the first thing. The second thing, I think more studies need to be done, especially the real world um, efficacy studies where um, you actually look at the different dosing uh, with this targeted therapy, uh, because as mentioned, the pharmacodynamic of this targeted therapy suggests that perhaps the lower dose of the existing targeted therapy can be used with the same efficacy and effectiveness. And if that is the case, then you could actually get uh, or half the price uh, of this targeted therapy. So the third one is, of course, the pharmaceutical companies to have the uh, managed access programs for some of these drugs. And this is where through your oncologist, you can access this and hopefully at a more affordable price. Okay. Like most of the time, molecular profiling might not yield the results that can be matched with available targeted therapy. So like, why would you bother testing? Anyway. Yes, that's again a very good question. Uh, the reason I think um, you want to do it if it is possible, if it is affordable, or if it is covered by the insurance uh, is due to a couple of reasons. Number one is um, you can, if so one in five people that you test uh, would have the chance of having that match between the molecular profiling results and the targeted therapy. So you've got 20% chance there. And in the uh, realm of lung cancer with poor prognosis, as mentioned, 50% is actually a big deal. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that um, uh, uh, the linking with the clinical trials or the access programs and for better survival outcomes for this cohort that can be linked to these programs and these drugs. Secondly, even see if the results uh, at this stage uh, is negative for the other 80% of the population, the information that you're contributing uh, for further research, for further drug development uh, would actually be tremendous. And in fact, you could then analyze and understand the genomic um, uh, landscape uh, of lung cancer in, say, the Malaysian population. And that would help the scientific community locally and regionally to develop more clinical trials um, to try to match new drugs with the uh, genetic mutations that you have 
if not now, sometime in the future. So one is for the ter therapy or therapeutic benefit, and number two for the scientific and for uh, continuous development in the field of lung cancer. Um, like the overall survival benefit in the context of EGFR inhibitors have not been proven statistically. Like, would you, um, like, why would you start people on the EGFR inhibitors? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, the reason is, um, while we have not seen or we can't see uh, the OS benefit for some of uh, these trials that were published, um, when it was um, scrutinized further, most likely, I think, uh, is because uh, that relates to the trial design. So the trial design or the trial was designed in such a way that um, the crossover uh, was allowed between the um, chemotherapy arm, for instance, or previous generation of um, TKI uh, to the new um, intervention, to the intervention arm. Uh, that's, I think, that's why the, the progression-free survival was used as the primary endpoint, because you, you can then demonstrate the drug efficacy, uh, because the overall survival would be diluted by the crossover um, effect. Uh, and that's the reason uh, why we're not seeing uh, the uh, OS benefit. And even, for instance, hypothetically, we say that, oh, there is no OS benefit, but just imagine the chemotherapy side effects versus the side effect profile of the targeted therapy. I'm sure a lot of people would be more keen to have targeted therapy if only this targeted therapy can be more affordable. All right. Um, one last question, Dr. Christian, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Can I ask, like, uh, what can be done to increase the pickup rate of this disease at an early stage, like especially the young population has never smoked? Uh, this is a very good question. Actually, for the National Cancer Society of Malaysia, <laughs> with regards to the uh, uh, screening and whatnot, uh, this is the tricky bit in the context of lung cancer because we know that uh, lung cancer, as many other ca cancers, uh, lung cancer is a silent disease, especially in the younger population. You've got a good physiological reserve. Most of the time, people are asym asymptomatic until uh, you, are, you reach the advanced stage, stage three or four, or the cancer is big enough to cause uh, anatomical obstruction and so on. Uh, because of that, it is not easy to actually screen and pick up it at an, at, at an early rate. In saying that, we know that the international trials called the NLST and Nelson trial uh, suggested that in the high-risk group, so 30 pack years and above, the population age 55 to 74, um, those uh, and, uh, and these are uh, heavy smokers or uh, former smokers, um, these people could attain the benefit in terms of uh, a decrease in mortality um, from lung cancer. And for instance, in the NLST study, uh, that study suggested a decrease of 20% uh, in mortality. So it is actually a quite targeted. Uh, it needs to be targeted. And unfortunately, in the younger population, the young Asian never smokers at the stage, we haven't got the screening program that can detect that early. Uh, but uh, I'm also aware uh, uh, about the local um, initiatives to try to use um, the AI um, to try to um, define the pulmonary nodules better and to see whether the use, the expansion and the use of the AI and low dose CT scan uh, in the younger group could yield better benefit, better pickup rate and better number needed to screen. So hopefully there will be more expansion in this field, although at this stage we haven't got much um, to try to increase the pickup rate at an early stage. Thank you so much for patiently answering all those questions. Um, I think that's all from uh, my side. Um, all right, then, uh, that's a wrap. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Sufyan, for that very insightful talk. Um, thank you all for your participation, and we hope to see you again at our next lecture series. Take care and enjoy your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.